And it is with great pleasure I introduce a man that needs no introduction in the Atlanta DevOps community. Um, this is John. Wanted, this is John Willis. He wanted to do another talk on burnout. This one's a little bit different. I'm excited to hear it, so I'm going to shut up and get off the stage. There we go. Good. I figured out how to turn on the thing, so you're in good shape. Um, yeah. How many people have seen any of my presentations on burnout? Not that many. Good. Good. So, because some of it's repeated, but I'll explain that. Oh, this doesn't work. Darn it. I got nothing working today. All right, let's do it the old-fashioned way. All right, so the agenda real quickly. This is probably a 40-minute presentation. I'm going to try to do it in 30 minutes. I'm going to talk fast. Introduction, disclaimer, why I was involved with burnout. What is burnout? What causes burnout? How do you overcome it? Caveat, caveat. Um, and then I'm going to end with some wild speculation. actually turns this into a, um, a progressive IT talk. All right, thank you. Um, so my name is John Willis. Uh, I go by the Twitter handle of BotchGaloop. That's primarily how I communicate, although you could ping me at uh, john.willis at docker.com. But if it's DevOps related or things around this, then um, my kind of BotchGaloop Twitter handle is the best place. I I've done a lot of stuff, been in IT operations 35 years, a lot of failed startups. Uh, the startup gods in the last four years. John, how long ago was in Stratius to Dell? That not, uh, five years, holy crap, okay. Thank you, sir. Um, so, all right, the last five years of startup gods have been good to me. Uh, John and I worked together, we sold the company to uh, Dell, and about a little bit over a year ago, I sold the company to Docker. So that was uh, good after about 20 years of just miserable failures. Um, uh, I'm considered what's called a DevOps core organizer. Um, uh, there's a couple in the room, uh, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. I, I was. At the original DevOps days in Ghent, I was the only American there. Um, helped organize the first DevOps days in the US. A lot of DevOps days. Um, and then um, I'm pretty proud. I'm, I've been working with Gene Kim for the uh, last um, probably eight years now, I think. But, um, but been heavily involved in so-called DevOps Enterprise Summit. This will be our third year running it uh, in November. It's a pretty awesome for enterprise presentations and what's going on with DevOps. I'm an organizer on that. And I'm a co-author of a book coming out called The DevOps Handbook. I also do a DevOps Cafe with my really dear friend, Damon Edwards. Uh, we just have a lot of fun. Oh, there's the handbook. Yeah, OK. Um, and and uh, so that's enough uh, self-promotion. Um, did anybody see that line item that said I had a PhD in psychology? No? Because it ain't there. Um, I don't have one. Um, so, so everything I'm about to tell you is not professional advice. I'm not qualified to do that, right? I have some. Um, research that I've done. I have some thoughts that I'll share with you about, about this whole space. Um, but at the end of the day, some of these things I'm going to talk about are clinical problems. And the word clinical should be a clue that you probably should get professional advice on anything that's, uh, and I mean that without, you know, joking aside, one of my favorite all-time characters um, on the slide. Um, so why me? I, you know, so I, a uh, little story. I, I, um, I'll tell you a little about the backdrop a little bit, uh, but I want to tell you more about the research that I've learned. So uh, last year, I did a couple of keynotes on burnout, and it was really a cathartic response to an incident that happened, a blog article I wrote, and then the response to the blog article. So it was really not like I wasn't trying to change the world. I was just so emotionally touched by this situation and the situation on top of the situation, which was the response. And then uh, a good friend of mine, Randy Shoup, used to work at Google. He's, uh, he does a lot of the QCon stuff. He said, I'd love to give you a burnout. We're doing our, um, you know, kind of life track. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And, was, and then I submitted the abstract for burnout. And I was actually going to put the whole presentation to bed. I was like, you know, I did it twice last year in keynotes. And, uh, you know, like, I don't want to be the burnout guy, right? I, like, I didn't sign up for that job. Um, and then he said, you know, like, after I submitted, after I got accepted, he said, oh, by the way, can you tell how, can you figure out in the presentation a way to tell people how you can help them? I go, oh, shit. Like, that's not going to be easy. So what I did is I actually went and I did a ton of research. I was like, all right, you know, I'll take this challenge. And I actually learned a lot about this space that actually got me more excited in terms of less about how sad story it could be and more about how actually we could use it as um, a way to get actually strategically um, create high-performing organizations. But that's at the end. So, I've got a, a couple of um, presentations, and, and I don't want to spend too much time, but 
this gentleman um, in early 2015 committed suicide. He's a, he's a young man that I got to know over about three or four years um, at a conference that I would go to. And it just tore me to shreds. Because I knew him, I knew what his life was like. We had talked about, I'd helped him a couple of times talk about what, how would he do a startup, um, those kind of things. And his name's Carla Flores, and you know, just, you know, just a picture. And I, every time I give this presentation, I'm like, should I take this slide out? Because am I like t taking advantage? And at the end of the day, though, I think if people understand some of the things that maybe happened to him and, and, and what you know, could be an outcome of a positive, you know, I'm pretty sure this kid would have like, really appreciated his slide staying in the deck. So, um, so there's a whole blog article. So I found out that this young man committed suicide. I had another friend that got out of the industry. One of the early DevOps um, people that a lot of people know and respect just got completely out of the industry because of burnout. In fact, stood up in a Tel Aviv DevOps days. The presentation's out there where like, we're in the room and like, this is a friend of mine who I thought, like, this guy's great. Like, sit down. It's going to be the greatest presentation. He always kills it. I shouldn't even use that word. But he says, five minutes into the presentation, he says, uh, yeah, last year was a tough year to me. I, I, I actually contemplated committing suicide. Wife, two kids. I mean, he didn't commit suicide, but he actually got out of the industry. Um, and then on top of that, then I have this thing happen. And so I just, I called Gene. I said, Gene, I need to write a blog about this. Is you have to put it on IT Revolution, which is Gene's kind of publishing site for the Phoenix Project and all other things. Put it out there. No, you know, fine, fine. All right, done. You know, let's move on my life. And then um, I love this, my favorite Edward Munch painting. Um, it's called uh, Red Virginia Creeper, right? And like, if you get Munch, like, he's eerie. But like, see the stranglehold on that house, that eerie house? The response to that blog article was insane. I got hundreds and hundreds of emails. There were a thousand comments. We actually went on suicide watch for a person. Um, I got emails from people that were famous, people I didn't know. I'm certain a few of them actually didn't like me and sent me an email saying, John, let me tell you my story and why it's so important you keep talking about this. Right? And so, um, so 2015, was, was an interesting year because um, like burnout kind of got in the map on our, in our industry. Uh, Velocity's run three panels. Um, Interop even ran one. Interop, the network folk, those staunchy old bearded people, right? Like those people actually ran a burnout session, right? Um, the conversation's great. Gene added a couple of questions in the DevOps survey um, about it. So it was interesting. So that was kind of how it is. And like I said, it chose me. So this is the part where it's like, what is burnout? Um, the, I would say it is definitely, like if you learn more about it, it's a canary in the coal line, right? It, it, um, like we don't even understand some of the impact it actually causes on us. And I tell you, some of the people that I got these emails from are people that you think, oh my God, these, these are people that like change the world every day. Um, so, so there's kind of what I would consider lagging indicators. These are things that if you classically read burnout, like you, you know, for an organization there could be health, Increased healthcare costs. There could be lawsuits. Um, there could be, you know, turnover. Typically, what happens when somebody gets in kind of a burnout mode? Their first stage is to just say, "I can't hack it no more. This place is driving me nuts." They go to another place. A year later, I can't hack it no more. This place is driving me nuts. And in some cases, they get out of the industry. Like, you know, how many people know people that have actually gotten out of the industry? They just said, "Just screw it." And then people are like, "Wow, that person got out of the industry. What are they doing now? Yeah, they sell shoes and they love it." Right? Um, but here's the, the optics, too, right? Like, so the company where Carlo um, committed suicide, a week later, another gentleman on the same team committed suicide. Right? Now, I don't want to play the correlation as causation game because there are so many factors to this, this thing of why people do these things and the chemical imbalances and all the things that I don't have a degree in. Right? But the point is, it, was, it took a long time for that organization to convince people in LA that were, like, were very desirable, hireable people to come work in that company. Um, you know, I know the Hawks play Boston tonight, and I've actually been here like, like seven years now, and I think I am a Hawks fan, but I love my Larry Bird. <laughs> you know, he's my all-time favorite player. So the head fake, the master of head fake, right? I tried to do this in London, and they were like looking at me like, what's a head fake? I, can you explain that again? <laughs> It's all a foot fake, yeah, it's soccer, yeah. Um, there's leading indicators, right? These are things that are not really clear that, um, like, so one of the, one of the uh, researchers I'm going to talk about in a little bit, um, 
There's two primary research. There's a lot of research, but there's two that I've kind of gravitated to. And one expresses that in her research, the people who burn out most are the high performers. So you're like, whether you want to call them 10Xers or not, I, I'm not a 10X believer, but, but the point is the people who you think and put the most trust in, and, and I have my own evidence, um, you know, um, empirical data from, my, from the emails I got from some of the people, that some of the people who burn out are like the people that you think, oh my, this person is amazing. Don't even, just let them do what they do. And you don't know that they're in a burnout cycle. So, and what you find up happening is that like these missed deadlines, because you have a high level of trust, which is good, but you don't, you don't understand some of the symptoms of what's going on in that person or certain multiple people, missed opportunity, missed threats, the people who you most expect to protect and create the greatest ideas and, and create the most innovation are in some degraded cycle. Like that's, there's like the hidden costs there, you know, depending on the size of your company, just on the impact of the person, and the relationship they have with the deliverer of your services. Um, so there's uh, Jerry um, Powell, she has this uh, BDOC, and, and uh, she's got some really good videos out there. I, that she's the one that has the research on, on the idea that um, the high performers are the ones in her research. But she has this kind of, um, you know, you, you start with hope, frustration, anger, apathy, and then you're into kind of a, a burnout manifestation. Um, she also does, she's trying to do a lot of research where she's trying to say that burnout should be clinically equivalent to PTSD, right? Um, because, you know, I, I think every scientist that studies this agrees. Uh, they just want to get it as a, uh, as a classification. But here's the thing, right? She says that on average in her research, it takes like six months to get from kind of a hope to um, burnout manifestation. And it takes, um, best case, two years to get out of it. And by the way, in most cases, getting out of it is what she calls residual burnout which is you get to a stage, you get to this level of where you kind of get control over it, but you go back and you actually play this kind of a ping pong with burnout. And, you, and again, the question I asked earlier, how many people know people left the industry, right? Or how many people know people that say, I'm, you know, I just can't work there anymore, and they go here, right? Like, so, so the, 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 there's a, just a, a high cost to this, this model. Um, you know, and then there's the, you know, leaving the industry. When we see giants, people that we like expect, you know, I've read, I, I got to do a shout out to Jeff's book. It's amazing. It's an amazing book. I've told that 10 times. I knew Jeff before he wrote the book. Um, I didn't really th think he was that smart. No, nah, just kidding, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> the book is awesome. Um, like, if Jeff left the industry, that, that would suck for the industry. It would totally suck for the industry. Like, um, and, uh, you know, and then obviously suicide, right? Like, that's, hopefully that doesn't happen. Those are the kind of anomalies. So what's the clinical definition of burnout? I mean, so it was coined in 1974. Um, what's really interesting, um, I, some of the research I couldn't fit into the presentation is, in Japan, you know, we owed the, the, the Michael Keaton movie where he's, uh, the, the, the Bill, what's it called again? Gun Ho, gun -ho right? Like, like that, you know, that whole thing in that movie where the Gun Ho and everybody, like Japan went through this like industry crisis or a country crisis over burnout. You know, they've made up a word, karajatsu, and, and, and for, um, that was the name of my blog article, is like death by overwork, right? Or, and so there's like ridiculous, the, the whole country created a, a first class priority to understand why people were uh, burning out um, and, and committing suicide. So there's a lot of research on that. But the, the best research that I found, and I think from reading what people would say is the best the, uh, researcher, is a woman called Christina Maslick. She actually was on the first panel. So it's interesting. Uh, I, this is my luck, right? First vacation I actually get in about three years is the week of velocity when they invite Christina Maslach to be on a panel that I was supposed to be on because the reason they're doing the panel is because I wrote my blog article. Couldn't go there. Had to do a family vacation. So I never got to meet her. But, um, but she is um, she's like whatever the highest level professor at Stanford and is considered kind of the industry expert on occupational burnout. And, and so the standard for burnout is basically these three um, criteria, um, exhaustion, cynicism, and efficacy. Um, exhaustion is obvious, overwork, but although not the most obvious symptom. Like, like we have companies that have death marches and they basically drive people crazy, you know, again, drive people to a place that, that gets them into some form of depression or clinical state, right? Um, like those are obvious, we can figure those out. Um, but the, the harder ones to figure out is the cynicism and efficacy. And cynicism is interesting because um, 
I think the ship show just recently did a, um, uh, uh, they had Christina Maslach on. And it was interesting because I'd done a lot of reading about this. And like cynicism, everybody kept asking, well, I'm cynical. Like we're all cynical, right? That's not what she's talking about. She's not talking about kind of joking. And what she's talking about is a level of uh, kind of a disconnectedness where you get to the point, like a symptom of what she means for cynicism is, you know what, you're all a bunch of friggin' idiots. I'm just going to do the way I do it. Which is basically saying, or just, or just leave me alone and let me do it, finish this, this, this product. Which is basically saying, you're all a bunch of idiots and, like, I, you know, you've disconnected from the, from the thing. You're like, you know what, I've had enough. And then efficacy is, is again, a harder, even harder one to figure out because that's, um, do you, and uh, Rebecca talked a little bit about this. And I, tell you, I think the, some of the things she covered, I tried to make some mental notes like, oh, yeah, that was a great point for this. But, um, but like, the efficacy is, do I feel like what I do is valued uh, by the you know, organization that I work for? Right? And it's a big thing there. I mean, how, how many people in their career have worked for companies would have felt like, you know what, they don't listen to a goddamn word I say. Remember his hands? Nobody? Really? Come on. You're all liars. Uh, sorry. Not in this industry. Sorry. Um, so Maslach has this thing called... It's actually something that's really interesting called psychometrics, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But it's a psychometric survey. You combine statistical analysis and, and psychological, and you create a, a survey that creates statistic val statistically valid data. Um, she, has, she has created something called the MBI, the Maslach Burnout Index, which is today what people consider the industry standard for um, as a psychometric survey to, um, to study or evaluate burn out individuals or teams or organizations or even um, whole um, occupations with those three. It's the primary three. What's interesting is um, in Austin, um, DevOps days, I gave that, that was one of the keynotes I gave. I met a guy named Josh Corman for Sonatype, a big fan of his. And he was involved in about a year earlier or so where the IT sec industry had got together and said, you know, we're tired of people dying in our industry. Like the suicide rate was getting high enough that they actually ran an MBI with, against 400 um, um, IT sec professionals to try to just figure out, like, where do we rate? And it was interesting because their rate, I forget the actual definition, but like the, the output of the survey showed that IT sec people kind of were in the same area, policemen, firemen, and, you know, things that were um, healthcare, which are considered a high stress, particularly high burnout occupations. Here's the thing. So as I was getting serious about this, in fact, a while back, Gene had asked me, why don't we do um, a burnout survey in DevOps? And I still want to do that. And so I went out to that thing, and it's only $15. I'm like, ah, yeah, I'm going to do it. Mean, let's just figure out what this MBI thing's all about. And the joke was on me. Because what was happening, when I went in and go and say, you know, I'm going to game this a little bit. I want to see what the output looks like. I want to understand what the MBI really looks like from a psychometric survey perspective. But it was about four months into, if anybody's listening from Docker, I'm busted. But um, it was about four or five months into after I went to Docker and I got acquired. And Docker had grown pretty big and, and like there was a lot of moving parts. I was remote. And, uh, and so what's interesting is as I read through my, I was okay on the exhaustion thing. Um, I was off the chart, arguably clinical, on cynicism and uh, efficacy. Lower efficacy, right, means I don't feel. And then I started thinking about, like the, 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 the original thing, the intent was to learn about this so I can use it in presentation or maybe do that in a survey. And now I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like the output of the survey, the report you get is like saying, Dude, you need to read this book. You probably know to go see a psychologist. I'm like, uh-oh. Like, and uh, so I started actually saying, okay, well, what's going on here? And what's interesting, it helped me. And I'll talk about this in the self-awareness. I'm, I'm probably going to run out of time, but I don't have to. Somebody's going to have to body block Chris when he gets up to and take me on stage. But um, the, um, as I went through it, I started thinking about some of the things that I, the choices I've made about working for Docker. I'm remote. I, I've always usually are in a boardroom. Most companies I've worked with over the last 25 years, I am in the room with a whiteboard where you talk about what's going to happen in almost every aspect of the company. I hired the first salesman at Chef. The first salesperson that worked at Chef, I hired. Like, that, like that's the game I've been playing for 25 years. Now all of a sudden, 
I find out through secondhand emails or a third week later that we have a strategy about this and this. And it was driving me nuts, and I didn't even know it. And then I made the decision, John, what do you want to do? Do you want to, how many people here live in Atlanta? Oh, not that many. Right? Like, we don't want to move out to Silicon Valley in San Francisco. No, 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 no. Because our 2,000 to 4,000 square foot house is going to be exponentially higher. Our kids are probably not going to go to as good a school. Um, right? Like, so I'm not going to California. And then I was like, John, like, then shut up. Quit complaining. Right? So it was very helpful for me, and I didn't even know it was going to be helpful. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so in some further research that Christina Maslach has done, um, she talks about the six mismatches. So originally she came up with the uh, NBA. Actually, very interesting about uh, Christina Maslach. This is, again, where I get in trouble. She was actually in the original Stanford prison sub. She was a student in the original Stanford prison sub. So she's got an amazing resume, right? But anyway, in some of her later research, she talks about the six mismatches. And on, like, you say, okay, work overload, lack of control, insufficient reward, breakdown of community, absence of fairness, and conflicting values. All right, so we've expanded it. I'll talk a little about more of this in a minute. So how to overcome. I'm going to come back to the mismatches because this is really important. Self-awareness. So I, I think I, I put it out. Like, like, if it takes a psychometric survey for you to understand it, maybe you can get your team to take it. I mean, it's $15, right? Like, you can, uh, the cost per hundred goes into some ridiculously low number. I literally want, it's on my checklist to try to run one for our, what we call DevOps industry. Um, but I love this, um, and I, I've changed that to people. I think back in the day, everything was a man, so I changed it to people, because I think it's the right way to express this. Um, it, um, hepatitis, um, basically, you know, like, and this is so me. I'll give a, like today I'll give a presentation. No, it's usually a technical presentation. So I give a presentation on cloud or something like that. And then, and then like, I'll get like a bunch of comments on Twitter, and most of them are pretty positive. And then one comment there, you can see the, uh, you can be a jerk. So mine will be like, somebody will tell me I don't understand cap theorem, and I'm an idiot, and I should never dare talk about cloud. And, and so later on, the only one I remember is the one where I'm getting yelled at for not expressing cap theorem in the proper way. And by the time I go to bed, that's the only thing I'm thinking about. You know, hepatitis says people are disturbed not by the things, but by the view in which they take of them. Um, so... The MBI is, is a resource. There's actually the six mismatch. There's a free version that you can do, and it gives you the, uh, some of the stuff. And then actually, um, Ms. Maslach and, and team have created um, what they call the uh, active, uh, area of work-life survey. And that's the six mismatches. I have not taken this one. Um, I think this is interesting. I think there's a lot more work has to go into this one. Um, I, I, I found that this book, it was funny. When we first started doing open spaces on burnout, so I did a couple of rotations, and we started doing open spaces on burnout. And I was thinking, you know, I'm never going to recommend any type of book or anything about this because that would be beyond the scope of what I should be doing. People, but this book had helped me years ago with some depression. And then it came up over and over and over in these open space discussions about burnout, about other people saying this book helped. So I figured, you know what? Um, Brendan Franklin, The Constitution. Only gives the right to people to pursue happiness. You have to catch it yourself. Uh, happiness science is a pretty interesting discussion in itself. This is a very interesting book. Um, um, I think um, Rebecca had some great points that had totally overlap with this. Um, you know, I, I would say, again, from my non-psychology degree, listen really hard, but talk. Like, give feedback. One of the interesting things um, we had uh, in, the, um, in Vegas at Interop, there was a an open discussion about burnout. They brought in um, a suicide prevention specialist. Kept his mouth shut the whole time. At the end, he gave us some advice. One of the most interesting advice things, I thought, was he said that most people think when you are dealing with somebody who you might think is in a stage where they might be thinking about committing suicide, that if you even mention the word suicide, they're going to run off and commit suicide. And it's just the opposite. Actually, asking the question is hard. I don't know that this, I'm giving this advice. This is what he said. Asking somebody that you think is in a danger zone, are you thinking about committing suicide? He said, and he did have psychological degree and an incredible amount of experience. Imagine being a suicide prevention person in Vegas. Um, he said that that actually creates in most people a, a, a feeling of relief. Like, oh, you understand me. Yeah, I am thinking about it. Like, that was so counterintuitive to me, right? Like, um, so again, I think 
being courageous. Some of my other presentations, I don't have time to talk about being courageous and, and um, being uh, vulnerable, making yourself vulnerable. I mean, giving a presentation about this, talking about your feelings and things, talking about psychology, ooh, squishy, yeah, right? Like, like being vulnerable means you're you know, willing to talk about that. Um, you know, I think, I'm going to get into the mismatches now, I think it's important. So I think, as I go back over the mismatches in a minute, I think there's an opportunity. So as I'm going through this research, I'm realizing, oh my goodness, here's the first hint. The six mismatches are the anti-patterns of what we consider best practice DevOps patterns. Ah, wow, let's think about this. And then what if, what if we tried to really understand our, so the, the concept of a mismatch is, it's not necessarily this person stinks at all these things, and it's not necessarily the company stinks at all these things, it's actually, if you think about systems thinking, it's the system. So you in this system are part of the system, and maybe it doesn't work with you there. But somebody else, it might work perfectly. And so I think, as I think about, a few years ago, I did a presentation about culture as a strategic weapon. And I thought, you know, if you look at, um, you know, Netflix is great, right? They have the culture deck. CEO puts out a culture deck. Very bold about, like, this is the way Netflix works, folks. Like, honestly, read it. And Adrian Krakow, on uh, one of the primary architects of Netflix, we had him on our, one of our podcasts. And I know Adrian, he's a friend of mine, but you know, we've had this discussion. But he said that if you come in an interview at Netflix and you, A, have not run read Neil Hastings, the CEO's culture deck, and B, don't fully understand it, because they will quiz you, then the interview's over. Don't care if you're the greatest Java program on the planet. Um, like, don't care if you know everything about Amazon Cloud infrastructure, even if you work for Amazon. Like, that, on theory, that's the way they, they operate, right? Because they, what they're telling you is, we don't look like other companies. In fact, one of my favorite lines in that culture deck is, um, it is, adequate performance gets a generous severance. Like, we're not screwing around. Like, all our companies say, we hire the best people. But what happens when we don't hire the best person? Well, you know, you can't really fire them. They got kids. And, well, in Netflix, they fire you. They say, hey, you know, like, you read the thing, they, we didn't, sorry, have a nice life. Um, I think other companies are trying to get there, some of the rework from Google. So I think there's this trend for companies uh, to be transparent. You know, let's, let's try to match our culture to our people. Let's be transparent about who we are and what we think. So you can at least see that before you come in the door. Um, you know, Spotify does it from an engineering perspective. Obviously, Etsy is amazing at exposing their culture. Uh, code, code is craft. So wild speculation as we finish up. Um, so psychometrics is interesting. Um, I found it accidentally because I was, my kids was, is 11th grade, is going to senior and trying to figure out how to get him to the right career if he wants to listen to me. And it turns out I was just doing some survey stuff, uh, engineering, and, and psychometrics were one of the highest paid jobs. Like, hey, what's that? I, happened, I didn't know at the time, I actually knew a really good psychometrics expert, Nicole Forstrom, who works over chef. I had to run into start talking about psychometrics. She said, that's what I do, John. I'm like, oh, tell me more. Anyway, it's an interesting model of trying to figure out how to get valid statistical data by asking people questions. You know, I, I'm sure no psychometric would call it gaming the person, but it is in a way you're gaming people to make you think you're not really getting the question that you think you are. Like, you see these surveys, like, is Docker good? Yes or no? Like, that's not a way a psychometrics thinks, right? Like, we, we try to scale things from one to five. How strong do you feel about this? And, uh, and if you're taking DevOps surveys, you can see, has anybody, how many people have taken DevOps survey? Not that many, really. We need to raise that number. Um, the, you, you, you can see the methodology behind it. Right, so one of the things in the DevOps survey, so the DevOps survey is not a burnout survey. It's a survey that's gone on for like four or five years. The last three years have been really interesting uh, to try to understand um, what are we doing here? We all come up and we talk about this, we talk about that. Are we, are we really, can we have any data to prove that like CICD and this and this and all these things actually work? Well, that's what we've been doing for like three years. I see we as an outskirt as I work with Gene, but I'm not actually involved in the actual crafting of the survey. But the core of the survey is made on this uh, sociologist called Ron Westrom. It's called the uh, Ron Westrom um, model. And here again, I don't have a lot of time to spend on it. But the core of how that survey is crafted is based on these behavior patterns. And so they consider when you're, the data that you get from the output of the survey basically would say these 
companies have these characteristics, they're high performing organizations, and these um, companies have these characteristics and they're low performing organizations. And the, the backdrop is the difference between what we call pathological, bureaucratic, or generative, and you could take any one, but um, you know, take the second line on a messengers are shot in a pathological, messengers are tolerated, messengers are trained, right? Like you can get and see the messaging. So Nicole is what, she has done a lot of the core work of, and, and so two metrics that are really interesting, like last year, we saw um, a, a, a strong correlation in high-performing organizations, I'm not in a burnout thing, but I'm gonna bring it back, um, between people who do a lot of deploys, yeah, people who have a high change success rate, yeah, interesting, but here's the two that I love. The people that have shorter lead times have higher MTTRs, right? Um, like that, to me, that's golden. Because that's everything we wanted to be saying about, and we knew instinctively the people who have been doing this for five or six years talking and pro pontificating about DevOps. We knew instinctively that was true. We actually have data that proves it. That proves that if you're, you can do quicker, what it kills is the ITIL golden triangle. That you can choose speed or you can choose reliability, but you can't get both. Or you have to, you have to build a spectrum. We're, we're proving that with data that that's not true. So what Nicole does internally at Chef, this is amazing, and she's got a couple of presentations out there, and I really suggest you go watch them, uh, a couple of Dallas days. She runs that kind of psychometric survey that we've been doing for the industry, crafted internally for the organization with the Ron Western model to try to craft and find out, are they really practicing what they preach? Are they performing the way they think they do? So my wildest speculation would be, what if, A, we got rid of the word, stop treating the word psychology as a dirty word. Let's embrace it as another discipline of DevOps. So today, we embrace lean. We embrace resilience engineering. Guys like Decker, Woods, and Cook, a lot from John Ospar. Um, we, we embrace things from Peter Senge and learning organizations. We embrace things about occupational control, our change management. Um, John Cotter, let's add psychology in. There's a wealth of information. So what if we did that? And what if we hired psychometrics people in our organization to use Christina Maslach's six mismatches? And what if we actually tried to figure out who we really are? So instead of just a culture deck, let's actually use statistically valid data to match to who do we think we are based on these six principles. And let's ask the people that come into our organization to do some level of self-awareness or self-actualization to understand where they are. And let's figure out how we get the right people. So a couple of antidotes. Like you look at those and you say, well, yeah, that's all. I mean, I don't want anybody that doesn't do all those things. Not true. How many people, you're about to get gamed on this question. I'm even going to tell you that you're going to get gamed on this question. I still got that and we're going to get the same percentage I got in QCon London. How many people? I probably rubbed it. How many people would get upset if they found out the top three highest paid people in their company were sales reps? Come on, be honest. We're sales reps. The sales. Really? All right, a couple of honest people. I, I owe you, 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 and you a beer. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you found out, you didn't know, and you thought, you know, oh, the engineer genius, I make good money. And then all of a sudden, you accidentally saw a report, an email that shouldn't have gone to everybody. And it said that Joe had a sales in Northeast, Bill had a sales in Canada or whatever, and then you know Tom or Sue, and they were like off the chart their salaries, and every and, and the first engine, top engineer was like seventy, eighty thousand dollars less. Anyway, in, in London I didn't game them, and third of them said they'd be upset. But here's the thing, like if that upsets you and that's a stressor and the level of stress that that causes you. And this company might be, hey, that's the way we operate. We believe that the sales sell a lot of people, the stock goes up, every, right? Um, so there are, it's not always community. There's a, a pretty well-known um, consulting company in the community that where the CEO is, and, and I like this, but is like blatantly liberal. And the, the discussion throughout the whole company is reasonably liberal. Um, you can go to work there if you're a staunch conservative. But when you go to lunch, you know, the, the thing that uh, Rebecca talked about, like the fantasy football thing, right? Well, it, it, it has so many other permutations, right? It, like if the, if the whole company is like 
Gaga over Bernie Sanders every day, and you think Trump is the greatest guy on the planet, and you feel that you have to go to lunch because the boss is going to be there, like, it's going to cause stressors. Right? So it's not that easy. And again, I, I'm going to finish here now. But the brilliance of the opportunity is, A, to take these bad symptoms and turn them into high-performing opportunities, and B, understand that it is the system. It is not the individual, it's not the person, and there is no wrong or right, it's the match or mismatch. I have a lot of research out there, um, you can, uh, I'll put these slides up, and you know, almost everything that I talked about is some, a book or some paper, um, and, uh, and I won't go through the extra slides, but there's some really good stuff on just um, depression in general. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you, buddy. Good stuff as always. Are you going to hang out? Can you do an open space on yeah, Burnout yeah, this I, afternoon? I, I, yeah, Y'all want to hear an open space on Burnout from John? Does that sound like a plan?